Voice of the Mavericks, Hall of Fame broadcaster, Chuck Cooperstein on everything sports with us on 365 Sports with Craig and Paul, David Smoke, also Garrett Ross, Emery Winter, and Jack McKenzie running the studio and the mothership. Chuck, thank you very much. Hope you had a nice chance to take a deep breath for the second half of the NBA season. What are your thoughts about what college football is now doing, going to a 5-7 and seven model, and how would you do it if you could make that decision? I don't know that they have any other choice. I mean, with the Pac-12 going away, um, you know, and the Washington State and Oregon State basically, at least for this year, folding into the, uh, you know, to the Mountain West, at least they'll play the majority of their games against the Mountain West. I'm not, I'm not sure really what changes other than the fact that you've got one less conference that uh, is going to have a champion that would have an automatic bid. Now, you know, I guess the, the, the bigger, the, the bigger issue, I guess, is, you know, with, with, uh, outside of the SEC and the big 10, I mean, do those other three top seeds or certainly the top, you know, uh, the third and fourth seed, that would uh, get a buy in the first round. Should that be from a conference champion, or should that be, you know, from the if, if uh, you know if there's or there are two of the uh, four best teams or in both the SEC and the Big Ten, you know, should they not get those spots? I mean, that's that's the bigger question. I I, I can see some value in in uh, allowing the champion to have that uh, to have that higher seed, um, and, you know, and and just making sure that you know, you're getting the best teams you possibly can into the playoff. Chuck, do you think that there should be automatic more than one automatic qualifier per conference has been proposed allegedly by the Big Ten up to four? No. You win the league, you win the league, and that's why you have a committee to choose the best teams. And I would think in such a situation uh, that the Big Ten wouldn't have to worry about uh, getting their top two or three teams. Uh, into the tournament, uh, the same way for the SEC. But uh, you know, let this is why you have a committee. Let them let them figure that out. Um, I, you know, it's it's kind of disgusting, quite frankly, how the SEC and the Big Ten are acting. Uh, but you know, the, he who has the to, you know he who has the gold, you know, has uh, has the power, and they have the gold and they have the power, and they're trying to exercise it as much as they possibly can, even if it isn't necessarily uh, in the best interest of the entire sport of college football. So Chuck Cooperstein gets named commissioner of college football. Chuck, you've seen the uh, old the way, way of doing things. By the way, I would be the guy leading the way to get you that job. I would love it, yeah. You've seen the old way of doing things, uh, the the polls. You've seen the BCS. You've seen the 14. We're about to see the 12 team. What would Chuck Cooperstein, commissioner of college football's ideal way to settle a national champion be? I've said it for about 30 years. <laughs> you take the top, you take the 10 champions, of uh, in, in FBS of, of all leagues, and then you take six at larges and let's go play. And it me it, otherwise, if you're in the American or you're in the Mountain West or you're in the Mac, what's the point? Mm -hmm. What is the point of even doing this if at the end of the year you don't have a chance to win the national championship? And frankly, you know, you look at basketball, which which does have that way of thinking. They're trying to mess with that too. Yep. <laughs> and and that should scare the living hell out of anybody. I mean, they've got they've got something that's perfect, and they're trying to screw it up. And you know, but from football, I've always believed take you take the ten conference champions, you line them up, you take six at large teams, choose your leagues, whatever, go see them, let's go play. And and at that and also at that point. You know, as much as I'm a, a a fan of the Cotton Bowl and the people at the Cotton Bowl and, and the job that they do, uh, this should be something that is out of the purview of the bowls. This is something that, frankly, they should be playing uh, on campus, at least through the semifinals, uh, and maybe even to the final. And then you, you bid the thing out, and that's how you make your money. I mean, again, that's how the NCAA – has uh, has worked its tournament, and it's why the NCAA tournament is the most successful uh, college uh, venture that there is. Because it, it, the NCAA doesn't do much right, but they do know how to run events right, and they run that event right. And wh why wouldn't football take a page from that? But again, we've been saying that for 30 years, uh, at least maybe even longer. And uh, if nothing else, we know that football is, uh, they're kind of like the, that ship, 
driving toward the Titanic. They are, they are uh, driving toward the iceberg, right? They're, they are loath to change it, and they're willing to wreck it if, uh, if it just suits their purpose. You mentioned why play if you don't have a chance, which is all about hope. You, you start the season. You start working out in August. You have hope you could play for a national title, even if it might be very slim. If, in fact, there ever is another separation of the top level, the FBS that goes into some whatever it would be, 32, 48, if that ever happens, I would see schools like Baylor, TCU, Kansas State, et cetera, even perhaps an Oklahoma State or a Texas Tech, they're, the money they have invested in all of the growth of their athletic department, I think they would have, like, weeds coming out of their stadiums if they weren't included. There's no question. Absolutely no, no question about it. Uh, and that shouldn't be the case. I mean, it shouldn't be the case that we're involved in an arms race. But we are involved in an arms race, and, you know, the, the genie's out of the bottle there. But with it being out of the bottle – then at least give everybody a chance to fight. Now, you know, you can look at, you know, some league like the Mac where they really don't spend very much money on football, uh, a league like uh, the American where you have school, well, you know, now SMU obviously moved over to, to the ACC, but I mean, you've got some, some teams in that league that are willing to spend on football. The Mountain West has teams uh, and schools that are willing to spend. I mean, I, I think, you know, you do get to a point where, I mean, you, you should have, on some level, uh, you know, like-minded thought. Uh, and I realized maybe that goes against my original thought here of having all 10 conference champions, um, you know, qualify for the tournament. But again, this is about FBS, right? I mean, is, are the Big Ten and the SEC something other than FBS? If that's so, then then let them break away and let them go do their thing and let's – no, and, 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 and let's see what happens. Let's see what comes of all this. It's, it's an absolute cluster, and it's just a damn shame that we've, we've gotten to this point. Um, it, it, just, it could have been solved a long, long, long time ago, uh, and it really still hasn't been solved. I think ultimately when we get to uh, the 26th season and the new uh, uh, iteration of the, uh, of the football, of the playoff, I think you're going to see 16 teams. Uh, because that that's the logical number. Don't give anybody buys. Let's go play four games and you know all about the money and uh, and let's and let's see who prevails in that. Chuck, you mentioned um, the bowls uh, a second ago, and you know the Cotton Bowl again. The, like one of the, probably the best run of them all, really, in the way that they've they've handled things over the years. But it is now the whole thing is changing. And they've all become antiquated, but they are all nice rackets for the people involved. So how does college football tell them, like, look, we're past the time where we need you, especially when playing these games, especially the playoff games on campus, is going to be way better than having a bunch of neutral site games heading all the way into what should be the only neutral site game, which would be the national championship. It's, it's a really good question. And, and the, the problem is that you have like this year's cotton bowl with Missouri and Ohio state, and you have Marvin Harrison, uh, you know, crashing and burning here right before kickoff, you know, and, and decide, you know, when he, he makes the trip, but he doesn't play in the game. I mean, how ridiculous was that? And the game was a horrible game. It was an absolutely horrible game and good on Missouri for winning the game, but it was a horrible game. And, you know, unless those people are involved in the actual, you know, bidding for uh, playoff games. Again, you know, Dallas is going to have the South Regional uh, of the NCAAs this year. Um, you know, the Dallas Sports Commission is involved with that. Uh, there's no reason why the Cotton Bowl, you know, those people, you know, affiliated with the Cotton Bowl and then by extension the Dallas Sports Commission, you know, could not take on the uh, – the, the responsibility of, of running the game, of bidding, of you know, doing whatever you have to do. I mean, again, the basketball model has been proven to work. Uh, why football refuses to go with that model is just beyond me. Chuck, what do you think about the sledgehammer of the Big 12 that's now even a bigger sledgehammer and about to be even a larger sledgehammer next year with Arizona, among others? Uh, I mean, it's... Uh, you turn around, it's like bow in the ring, isn't it? 
It, it, no kidding, man. It, it is just <laughs> phenomenal to watch. It, it really is. Now, I will say the end The end of the Houston-Iowa State game the other night was a little disappointing just because it was nothing but a free-throw fest for the last you know four minutes of that game. And then I don't know if you watched the, uh, the Arkansas A&M game last night. <laughs> That game, that game didn't end until 8.35. It was a two-hour, 35-minute college game with no overtime. Mm-hmm. I mean, so maybe a little too too many fouls. And, again, there are rules changes the college could go to that would, I think, would alleviate a lot of that. Um, but, you know, that's another uh, discussion for another time. But, uh, you know, look, uh, this league, every night, it's the closest thing to the NBA that there is in that any team, maybe with the exception of Oklahoma State, can beat anybody else, and especially if they're playing at home. Uh, the home court advantages in this league are just off the charts. I mean, you, you look at, at Kansas and you look at Texas Tech and you look um, you know, at uh, – I think, I think Baylor's got a great home court advantage. Houston, obviously. It's, it's, when you went on the road, you have definitely earned something uh, in this league. And, you know, if you're like if you're TCU and Baylor this morning and you're running around with, uh, you know, seven and six records in conference play and you think and you're thinking, well, that's it's pretty ordinary. Well, again, it, the competition that you're playing is is just extraordinary every night. And if you don't bring it every night, there is a real good chance you're going to get beat by 15 to 20 points. So it's on everybody. But for all of us, it's incredible entertainment. Have you done a game at all? And I know that a lot of times you do tournament games, but have you ever done a game from where BYU plays or Allen Fieldhouse or in Lubbock uh, uh, where Texas Tech has their, their uh, arena? I, I, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, now, now at, uh, I, I have done a game uh, at, uh, at the new building in Lubbock, but it was a TV, I was a TV guy that night, so right. I was on the floor. Okay. Um, you know, and, and at BYU, I actually did a game there with TCU back in the 80s, and we were on the floor. So I, I don't know where they are now. But, you know, listen, that's what we deal with in the NBA all the time. And I know Kansas has been off the floor for a long time, um, you know, and probably forever. Uh, but uh, that's, you know, in the NBA right now, we have only one place in the entire league. We're on the front row, uh, and that's in Chicago. Hmm. Um, there are a couple of places like Toronto and Detroit uh, where we're in the, uh, in the second row. But most of the time, we're at the back of the lower bowl. Uh, that's where that's where we're set up, and you know, on one le- on one aspect of it, it's great. Um, you know, you do have a, a you can have a really a nice view of the floor, and you can see how some things do develop. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, you want to be in the middle of it. I mean, you want to hear the the by play between the players and players and coaches and and officials and and all of that. And you and you don't get that, and you don't get the feeling. Uh, when you're off the floor like we are, just how fast the game is and how physical the game is, and especially the NBA. I mean, college isn't quite that way, but it's close enough. I mean, so you, you don't get that same experience. But you know, I do see a lot of places in college where they still are on the floor, and that's great, and I hope they're, they're allowed to stay there. Chuck, it's become almost like yearly uh, that the All-Star Weekend and the NBA comes around, and, and there's things that are that are you know fun and, and takeaways, but there's always now like a, a complaint about the All-Star format and the weekend, just the, the festivities in general. I'm not going to be like the hot take factory that I've seen of, of all the opinions over the last couple of days, but you as a, a guy who's so deeply embedded within the league, what are your thoughts on the All-Star game? And just in general, is what would you do about it, if anything? Well, I'd stop the game. If, if the attitude of the players is going to be this, uh, this is not good for the NBA. <laughs> I did, we, I'd find a different way. I'd, I'd move either All-Star Saturday night to Sunday uh, and just have it at that and just have this be one long convention uh, that is highlighted by the skills competition and uh, three-point contest and dunk contest and whatever else they want to do as part of, uh, as part of the deal on Sunday night. Uh, or uh, I would find a way to uh, rejigger the, the NBA Cup, the in-season tournament, and make sure that the uh, semifinals were on Friday and the final was on Sunday, and you'd have All Star Saturday night in the middle of that. Um, I mean, and I'm sure there are some logistical issues that you'd, you'd have to figure out in order to make that work. But uh, I mean, I love the All Star. I love the concept of the All Star game, and I think you know people saying, "Well, they don't want to get hurt." Well, hell, they didn't want to get hurt 40 years ago either, and they <laughs> still played like there was no tomorrow. I mean, it's, that's no excuse. I'm sorry. And also, if you are 
if, if you're a professional and you're going on the floor, uh, don't you think you want to put your best foot forward? Why would you, why would you want to embarrass yourself and embarrass the league by, by doing that? Uh, because everybody who looks at that, that's not basketball. It's not basketball on any level, let alone the best level of basketball in the world, which oh. is the NBA. Well, why, why would you do that? So if, if the, and it really is on the players. I mean, I don't think, um, you know, the urging of the commissioner uh, or of teams, if it came to that, uh, really makes much of a difference. It, this is really on the players. And if this is the attitude that the players want to take, toward that game, then the NBA should just pull the game because it, it doesn't it doesn't do them any good to put out a product like that. Chuck, if you don't mind, one question about a young man that you get to broadcast and you saw what Dirk did in his career. Have you run out of descriptions, words to describe, description words, to describe Luka Doncic? I'm getting close, I think. Um, and, but I, I hope I'm not running out because I plan on doing this a while and I'm planning <laughs> on... <laughs> And, I, and I'm planning on watching him do this for a while. So uh, he he's remarkable. He really is. Uh, you know, there's there's nothing in his game that uh, that he can't do. And the fact that he's improved his game in so many areas this year, uh, you know, his three point shooting, his free throw shooting, uh, his assist to turnover ratio, his his on ball defense. You know, he's in the top ten in the NBA in steals now. I mean, he's always had the ability to play the passing lanes and come up with steals, but now he's doing it at a at a much higher rate. Uh, it, it really it, it it's been uh, something to watch. I mean, he's always something to watch uh, because let's face it, uh, any night he walks out there, he's capable of doing something we've never seen before. And I think uh, Brian Sperry, who does the stats for uh, Valley Sports Southwest, has a note where I think there have been five different games this year that Luca has put together a line that has never been produced in the history of the NBA, mm-hmm. at least in the, certainly in the play-by-play era uh, and even going back to when steals and blocks started becoming a part of uh, uh, you know, the stat records back in the mid-'70s. Uh, that, that he's doing things that – now, we haven't seen, you know, we're, you're comparing him to Oscar Robertson and Russell Westbrook and, you know, basically some things that haven't happened in over 60 years in the league. Uh, you know, Oscar and Wilt. And it's, I mean, where do you go with that? If you love the game and love the history of the game, it's not difficult to appreciate what's going on out here. And now, uh, with the moves that the Mavericks have made, uh, the energy that those uh, moves have provided, uh, it really sets up for a dramatic second half of last, I should say, uh, last third of the season. Right. In fact, I, just was, I was working on a note with, with Luca. Luca has not had three consecutive games uh, this year where he has scored fewer than 30 points. Uh, he scored under 30 in his last two, and he's done it two other times this year. And in fact, you have to go back to uh, when he was coming out of COVID at the end of the 21 and uh, beginning of 2022 when he did it seven straight games to find the last time that he uh, had more than two consecutive games of fewer than 30 points. But now, but the Mavericks won both of those games against Washington and San Antonio. And he's got, he's got people who can, uh, who can help him. And obviously Kyrie's playing at a fantastic level right now. Uh, Josh Green has picked up his game, you know, Gafford and Lively in the middle are there, you know, to take lobs and, uh, you know, be able to play through, uh, you know, through him and you know, the understanding that those uh, people all have with one another, it's it's going to be really exciting to watch because I do think if Luca does stay pretty much on this pace uh, that he's on right now, which again, no one in the history of the NBA has ever done uh, a 34 nine and nine season, and he's just slightly below the rebound mark. Uh, and he's slightly over 34 points and nine and a half assists. No one has ever done 34, nine and nine. Uh, they have a pretty difficult schedule here, especially coming up in the next couple of weeks. But if they're in the high forties, low fifties, uh, when the, when the season comes to an end, I think it's going to be pretty hard to deny him the MVP. He turned, I really believe that he turns 25 in a week. That's crazy that, uh, he yep. is so, so talented in what he's done and he's still a pup. Chuck, as always, great to always have you on the show, man. The knowledge, the insight, the experience. Have a great week. We appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Take care. Chuck Cooperstein, voice of the Mavericks Hall of Fame broadcaster.